Welcome to this webinar, the second on social sciences role in reducing inequality hosted by the William T. Grant Foundation. I am Ryan Light, an associate professor of sociology at the University of Oregon. I am here today in my capacity as co-editor of the sociology journal Socius that recently published two articles and a series of commentaries on the topic of today's webinar. A previous webinar focused on the two articles and this webinar puts those articles in conversation with the commentaries. The plan for today's webinar includes this introduction, a brief overview of the two papers published in Socius, commentary presentations, a panel discussion, and a Q&A. You can submit your questions in the question section of the control panel at any time, and we will get to them at the end of the discussion. Also note that the handout section of the control panel has links to Socius, the relevant articles, and additional links on the William T. Grant Foundation website on a PDF. Socius, the journal in which this conversation originally appeared, is the open access journal of the American Sociological Association and is currently housed at the University of Oregon. The journal publishes over 100 social scientific articles a year that are freely available around the world. The bulk of these articles are original submissions, but we also arrange special collections on articles on relevant topics to the social scientific community. These are akin to special issues of print journals. Adam Gameron, president of the William T. Grant Foundation, guest edited the special collection that is the topic of today's webinar. The special collection focuses on two core questions. The first question posed by Adam in his introductory article is what has been sociology's role in responding to inequality? While sociology has been instrumental in building an understanding of inequality, its role in reducing inequality, as Adam writes, is less clear. The second question asks, what possible role sociology and the soci social sciences generally may play in reducing inequality moving forward? The two articles in the special collection, one co-authored by Bethany N. Fox Williams and the other co-authored by Andrew Nilani, who are participating in this webinar, both outline the limitations of prior research on inequality towards its reduction and offer strategies or avenues for sociological research that work towards reducing inequality. The four commentaries published in the special collection find much to agree with and to be inspired by these original articles, but also find ways that the argument can be pushed forward in often more radical ways. Together, the pieces in this special collection of Socius challenge social scientists to think more expansively, more creatively, and more directly about the social sciences role in reducing inequality. Next, Bethany Fox Williams, assistant professor of sociology at Lehman College, City University of New York, and Andrew Nilani, doctoral candidate in, in applied psychology at NYU, will provide an overview of the original articles. Adam Gameron, again president of the William T. Grant Foundation, will introduce the commentary authors and moderate the subsequent discussion. Now we turn to Bethany and Andrew. Thank you so much for the introduction. Brittany, excuse me, Brit, excuse me, Brittany. Thank you, Ryan, I appreciate that. Um, my name is Brittany Fox Williams, and I'm gonna take a few minutes to introduce one of the papers in this special collection entitled The Relevance of Inequality Research and Sociology for Inequality Reduction. In this paper, uh, my co-author Tom Dupree and I analyze sociology's stance on inequality reduction and the discipline's impact on this effort. Despite decades of robust research dedicated to understanding the characteristics, causes, and consequences of inequality, social scientists generally acknowledge that inequality has actually grown over the past 40 years. Ultimately, this represents a gap in what is known about inequality and what is actually done to address it. With this point in mind, Tom and I wrote a paper motivated by the following question. Next slide, please. How useful has sociological research been to the task of reducing inequality? In answering this question, we take a look at how the discipline approaches the study of social inequality. 
and we posit that contemporary sociological research is largely descriptive, explanatory, and what we refer to as frame shifting. Ultimately, in the paper, we call for what we refer to as feasibility research. Next slide, please. In the paper, we describe frame shifting research as work that creates narrative frames around how policymakers and the general public should think about inequality. Through these narrative frames, researchers aim to demonstrate the harms of inequality to the welfare of people, communities, and the nation as a whole, offer evidence-based critiques to challenge conventional wisdom about the causes of inequality, especially explanations related to individual and group-based differences in ability, motivation, and culture, and importantly, it encourages transformation of social structures that create and reproduce inequality in our society. This type of research is immensely valuable and indeed a necessary step on the path toward inequality reduction. But we argue in the paper that it's not enough, especially when it's decoupled from what we refer to as feasibility research. Next slide, please. So feasibility research and how we describe it aims to provide practical and durable strategies for reducing inequality, even in the absence of large scale social transformation. It also offers insights into behavioral and institutional reactions to these strategies that could potentially impede inequality reduction. We envision feasibility research as a bridge between the larger vision of frame shifting research and inequality and more focused social policy research. We envision feasibility research as helping to actualize the socially transformative goals of frame shifting narratives about inequality. And we call on inequality scholars to undertake more feasibility research to both enhance the value of frame shifting research and identify attainable approaches to improving lives and communities. This approach would strengthen sociology's claims to basic knowledge, as well as practical relevance, which is particularly necessary in this moment of social reckoning. So next, my colleague Andrew will discuss the second paper in the special collection and identify specific pathways for reducing inequality at scale. Thank you, thank you, Brittany. Um, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Hirokazu Yoshikawa and Prudence Cutter, um, our task was to identify examples where researchers have generated knowledge that has contributed to inequality reduction at scale. And so next slide, please. Our motivating question, our motivating question was that what can social scientists do in their role as researchers to generate the kinds of knowledge? that may lead to a reduction of social inequalities in youth outcomes and opportunities at scale. Um, and I will point out that uh, there were multiple perspectives that we drew on. Examples came from fields of economics, political science, psychology, human development, and education. Next slide. In looking at several of these examples, we delineated six pathways to produce this kind of knowledge. Um, I'll briefly summarize these pathways and offer some concluding uh, remarks. In looking at these examples, we group them uh, according to what may be more top-down kinds of pathways and more bottom-up kinds of um, pathways. And the first is research and policy and the policy making process itself. The, the next one is expanding indicators that we use to monitor societal inequality. The third is bringing data of inequality of opportunity in the policy process and not simply rely on data about inequality of outcomes. The fourth is contributing evidence to legal cases or action. The fifth, is delineating and countering the mechanisms of elite institutions and finally creating and strengthening social movements and advocacy work that may lead to inequality reduction and crucially for knowledge generation in any of these areas to make a difference it's important 
to pay attention not just to reducing the portion of our population that's experiencing some given inequality, but also interrupt the relational mechanisms that reproduce or reify that inequality. Pursuing this agenda poses some challenges to uh, training for future social scientists. Um, we must contend with the problem of scale, and that requires theoretical and methodological innovation. How might we leverage insights across different disciplines to conceptualize and test multi-level interventions aimed at reducing inequality? And second, there's the problem of urgency. Um, how might we reimagine barriers to knowledge generation and translation so that it benefits communities that are most impacted by inequality? And the third challenge that this research agenda brings up is the problem of power. How might we ask questions that are relevant to communities impacted by inequality, questions that are relevant for policymakers, while also uh, contributing to field building? Next slide. Next slide, thank you. Um, I want to uh, mention a word of thanks to the commentary authors and the support um, from editors and reviewers at the Socialist Journal. And there is in institutes at NYU, at CUNY, Columbia, that have also contributed to making this work possible. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany, and thank you, Andrew, for your provocative and interesting contributions, which have set the stage for a terrific conversation today. Uh, I'm Adam Gameron from the William T. Grant Foundation. I had the honor of serving as guest editor for this special collection. And I am so pleased today that we have the authors of four commentaries who will speak uh, about their reactions. The four authors are Michelle Jackson from Stanford University, Cecilia Menkevar from UCLA and president of the American Sociological Association, Elizabeth Moji, from, uh, who is the dean of the School of Education at the University of Michigan, and Herman van der Verforst, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Amsterdam and will soon be the chair of sociology at the European Institute in Florence, Italy. So we begin with Michelle. Thank you. So I'd like to thank the William T. Grant Foundation and Socius for making this event possible, and also the authors of the original papers for provoking this discussion. So in my piece, I wanted to challenge sociologists to not only commit themselves to change, but also to think about how best to lay the groundwork to build change. We're used to hearing this rhetorical, you know, what is to be done? But that's not really any good unless we also ask, well, how is it to be done? So in my paper, I try to think through some of the obstacles to building that more radical social science. Now, before I do that, I think it's really important to say that I think social science has done a great job in building the evidence that policymakers need. You know, we've accumulated a lot of evidence on the consequences of profound inequality for individuals and communities. A lot of good has been done by sociologists and other social scientists in shaping our inequality policy. But I do have concerns about three different aspects of social science that I think may be causing us some problems. So first of all, like all science, modern social science is highly specialized. So specialization can bring huge benefits. So when highly specialized researchers work on very narrow problems, that probably increases the quality and the quantity of research output. But the cost of it is that our research is less broad and we tend to end up in these relatively constrained and narrow zones where we all talk about the same narrow problems. And that then reduces our capacity to speak in very broad terms about the causes and consequences of inequality. Inequality is a big and expansive problem. And we're starting to get so focused in that we miss some of those bigger patterns. Increasing emphasis on causation has also pushed us to exploit techniques that speak to very narrow and precise mechanisms that operate within given contexts. And again, that brings some benefits. You know, we have more causal estimates today probably than we've ever had before. 
but it also comes with some costs. You know, we're taking on smaller questions and we're limited by the data that are amenable to causal tests. This has implications for the types of quality, the, the types of policies that can then claim empirical support. So it wasn't really that our inequality policy got small by itself. Our science helped to nudge it in that direction. And then I think the final obstacle that we have is public support. You know, it's undeniable that some of the policies that we might talk about actually could be pretty difficult to promote to the public. We need to think carefully about how we build that support. So in the paper, I include some proposals, I, I hope practical proposals, for how we might overcome some of these problems. Practically, what can we do to build a social science that makes it possible for radical policies to gain scientific and public credibility? Well, so the first thing is I think we could build some structures that will help inequality researchers to connect across different specialized subfields. I talk in the paper about journals and conferences that could help to synthesize literatures and allow researchers to talk to one another. That would help researchers to enter new fields and that would then broaden the set of voices that are represented in inequality research. The second proposal is that we improve access to administrative data. And administrative data are very useful when you want to test these big and bold policy ideas. I think we can probably take it as a given that policymakers are not going to implement more radical policies unless we have evidence that such policies will work. So we have to build that infrastructure that will allow us to test promising ideas and demonstrate the efficacy of these policies. And then finally, we need to think about building public support via communication, social science training, and also synthesizing the results of our research. I mean, I'm constantly dismayed by the disconnect that there is between our social scientific research and public opinion on inequality. I mean, if you look at public opinion, you will see that the vast majority of Americans believe that society should do what's necessary to deliver equal opportunity to everyone. Now, social scientists know that delivering equal to opportunity to everyone is well beyond our current policy infrastructure, but we don't say it in such stark terms communicating these very basic facts of inequality to the public, I think has the potential to increase support for these more radical policies that we would actually need in order to, to, del to deliver equal opportunity. So let me summarize by saying, I think there are structural reasons why sociological influence on inequality policy is relatively weak, and it's only by investing in structural reforms that we're likely to see improvements. We need to build those structures that will allow us to harness the power of our discipline to reduce inequality. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And as we transition over to Cecilia, I want to remind everybody that you can enter questions in the question panel of the control panel, and you don't need to wait until we're finished. You can go ahead with that right now and pile those questions in, and we'll get to them at the end. Thanks, Cecilia. Uh, yes. Um... Thank you, Adam, and thank you for the opportunity to share my reflections on this um, uh, very important topic for us sociologists, but for all social sciences. And we are at a crucial moment um, where we, um, we may need to take the radical steps that um, we're going to, that Michelle has started us on and that we need, need to, um, will help us to rethink how we do our work. Um, I am going to focus on one, um, one empirical case, the case of immigration and, and immigrants, um, because it allows us to um, connect to the other, um, to the other uh, points that people are raising in, in the way that because immigrant, uh, the, the topic of immigration and immigrants um, cuts across um, populations, groups, policies, and so um, I'm going to take this opportunity to highlight um, my reflections from this um, specific um, area of research. So we have, um, and I'm going to focus specifically on legal status for immigrants. Um, legal status has emerged as a dimension of inequality for immigrants and their families that cuts across 
all spheres of life in enduring fashion. And in this way, represents a fundamental factor shaping immigrant integration today for, for the individual immigrants, for their families, but also research has found that legal status has multi-generational effects. So in this way, there is an agreement in the scholarship of immigration on immigration that legal status has become an axis of stratification. This is especially the case when legal status intersects with other aspects of inequality, such as race, gender, and when where we start to see what we have been calling racialized legal statuses, that where legal status impacts certain groups more than others, amplifying inequalities for certain groups more than others. And so today, we know from the scholarship on immigration that legal status counts for more at the same time that it has become much more difficult to obtain. A barrage of laws and policies at different levels of government has elevated legal stat the weight of legal status for, for people. With some exceptions, governments at all levels, state, um, federal, a city, um, have made legal status a requirement to obtain benefits, including access to edu higher, uh, higher education, health, health insurance, um, access to um, cash assistance, public programs, etc. At the same time, paths to obtain secure legal statuses have narrowed dramatically. For some groups, these paths have been closed. So legal status has become a, and legal status has become a target for enforcement. So legal status really is um, central for the for uh, in the in immigrants' lives. As with other trends in inequality, we have acquired quite a bit of knowledge um, in the immigration scholarship on how legal status affects um, the life chances for immigrants and the long-term consequences that legal status has. So what do, we, um, what do we do with all this knowledge to have an impact on the lives of immigrants and, and families and communities? The scholarship on immigration with its attention to the effects of legal status has sort of naturally focused on generating policy recommendations um, and so in this way, I think it exemplifies how sh frame shifting research can be a bridge to policy solutions, including proposing modest strategies that could result in transformational changes in the lives of immigrants. Immigration scholars have been actively communicating research findings by educating policymakers, institutions, and communities on the detrimental effects of an insecure legal status and on the end of amplifying immigration enforcement and pointing to solutions. But what is the context where these contributions are being um, heard? Um, what can we do to have an impact? Um, at the state level, we, there are many um, small increments that can um, uh, open up opportunities for access to services, access to uh, driver's licenses. There's a number of things that I mentioned in the paper that can be done at the state level, at municipality levels. At the same time, um, legal status can only be granted by the federal government. So what we can do is to continue to um, advocate for an in-depth revamping of the federal immigration system. Um, and in this way, to also connect immigration research that touches on different aspects of life to broader policy um, solutions in other areas, in education, in work, in health, um, to in include um, um, benefits to immigrants, proposals for benefits to to, in, um, to immigrants in those in those areas. So to make it uh, to um, um, incorporate 
um, immigration research on um, as we think of other uh, policies in other areas. What in the immigration research, when um, we have to be specifically mindful of the social political context where our knowledge is is being um, is, and how it's being perceived, how it's being um, challenged, and how it's being um, resisted. We have to be very mindful that um, we face particular obstacles by the onslaught on anti-intellectualism, in misinformation, anti-science, that is amplified by um, a general um, um, hostility to, um, to, to anything related to, to regularizing immigration, immigrants and um, into changing um, immigration law. So we have to be very conscious about how we, um, how we communicate this research and how it's being, um, being received. Um, and lastly, I want to highlight um, that involving communities affected um, by, by, by these policies um, is also key. Um, addressing questions that are important for their lives, involving them in the research projects, involving them in um, and providing our knowledge and our, our scholarship to them for their advocacy efforts is also um, something that um, that could um, help alleviate some of the challenges that we see. In, um, in how we are translating um, immigration scholarship into um, policy, policy recommendations that can have an impact. Thank you so much. I'll stop there. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to echo my my colleagues uh, in thanking Ryan and Socius, Adam and William T. Grant Foundation, and my fellow authors of both the papers and commentaries for inspiring this conversation. I chose this title, Dismantling the Master's House, which many of you will recognize as borrowed from Audre Lorde's famous 1983 quote, to address the question that Adam posed around what the social sciences could do to bring our varied fields closer to the goal of reducing inequalities. I use Lord's quote, which reads in full, quote, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change, end quote. I, I use that because Lord argued for transformation of how we do our work, the tools, and not transformation of individuals. And that's really the overarching point of my essay. In the essay, I make four uh, supporting points, and I'm going to just run through those very quickly here. Um, first is on the value of frame shifting. You've heard Thomas's and Brittany's call for a move away from frame shifting research to research that identifies root causes and tests the feasibility of solutions. And I love the idea of the bridge um, that that feasibility research can provide. I use feasibility work in my own uh, research. At the same time, I wonder whether frame shifting research hasn't produced as much change as we would like because we haven't always asked the right questions. And also, how might understanding shift if the people most affected by inequalities were more involved in asking the questions and designing the studies as Cecilia just mentioned? This isn't a critique of the idea of conducting feasibility studies, but I hope that research that attempts to understand systems of inequality, systems of inequality, might still be a part of our toolkit. I hope that we won't stop trying to more fully understand the ways that inequalities and inequities are experienced, maintained, and reproduced in our social systems by putting the people who experience inequity at the center of the work. Now, shifting to the power of feasibility studies, I agree wholeheartedly with Thomas and Brittany that feasibility studies are powerful for reducing inequalities because they actually help us examine what works in context. 
At the same time, I worry about feasibility studies because they're always going to be conducted within systems of inequality. So it seems like feasibility itself will be defined by the very inequalities any intervention is attempting to dismantle. For example, we're doing some powerful curriculum intervention in Detroit schools that could be deemed infeasible in some instances because we don't have the technology tools we need to run the curriculum due to inequalities and really inequities in education funding at the state level. So the very intervention that could make a difference for students learning is also what makes the intervention infeasible. So what if feasibility studies instead examined the potential for a given intervention to disrupt the systems that distribute resources inequitably in our schools? And I think that many of the commentators are getting at this same kind of question. And that takes me to research that produces systems transformation for which we need to design new tools. And here I want to encourage social scientists to shift discourse from reducing inequalities to transforming systems of inequality. Words actually matter. So for example, reducing suggests that inequalities can never be fully eradicated. And the word inequalities actually doesn't fully acknowledge the systemic, intersectional, and interlocking nature of inequalities. In, our, in other words, our discourse really needs to focus on systems rather than situations. If we change the discourse, it changes our focus, and that requires us to change research questions and methods, and I'll get to that in just a minute. I also suggest that we should consider this idea of feasibility of systems disruption, and that means creating new methods as well. So how do we do this tool rebuilding? And here's where I conclude the paper with building on Andrew Prudence and Hero's piece by calling for new ways of working or redesigning our tools before we try to rebuild the house. I don't have time to share each of these, but each relates to one of the four points I've made. I'll highlight three here. First, I argue we need to seek diverse perspectives on the questions asked in research. We need to get people who are experiencing inequalities involved in that work. Second, we have to figure out how to attend to rather than control for variables, especially identity variables. I'd love us to think about strategies in regard to whether they work because they are centering an identity such as race, rather than controlling for it and attempting to generalize to everyone, which is really about generalizing to the center, to people already in, the, in power. And finally, I suggest that we examine feasibility across multiple systems, which will demand long-term team science that's embedded in and engaged with the communities we study, again, echoing Cecilia. I'm going to stop here uh, because I want to make sure that we have time for a great conversation, um, at which I really look forward to. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you. And I also would like to thank the William T. Grant Foundation and Socius um, Journal and, the, uh, and um, Adam Gameron for the invitation to reflect on the two fantastic papers by Brittany and Tom Dupreet and uh, Andrew Nalani and his co-authors. Um, I think it's a very important debate. Um, I've been discussing these at various instances with uh, several of the organizers in this crowd. Um, and as such, I think it is important for sociologists to think not only about understanding inequalities, but also perhaps um, about our role in reducing inequalities. Um, when I uh, read those papers, um, I, it reminded me of, of, of some issues that have been mentioned before in the sense that in sociology as a field, we see an increasing awareness of causal designs to study, impact, to, to study the impact of, of policies and programs and, and practices. Um, and this is a fantastic development, I think. It's a, it's a development that our field is in the middle of. Um, and as such, I think it is very important to have those designs. At the same time, um, there is a big, uh, I have a bit of a concern with um, a single-minded focus on, the, on those causal designs, despite their, their, their value. And that has two layers. One layer um, that I will just briefly mention now, it's exp explained in, in my discussion paper in, in Socius, um, is that with, with those causal designs, we might get the impression that now we know for certain 
what the particular effect is. And of course, that's never the case. So uh, researchers who are studying um, impacts of, of policies are always somewhat stretched between, let's say, the certainty that a policymaker uh, wants and the fundamental uncertainty of scientific knowledge. And to get out of that, I think we should reappreciate the development of theories to understand why particular uh, effects might happen, uh, for whom they matter, etc., and then do research in various different ways to study those processes. Not only in the causal designs, but you know, including ethnographies, uh, comparative research across countries, etc. Um, a, a second layer of, of my concern when it comes to the causal um, causal movement in, in our field. I think uh, relates to the idea that we should be able to understand the social political context or maybe even act upon the social and political context of, of uh, research findings. And uh, it's just not enough to show the evidence of some sort of, uh, some sort of effectiveness of a policy. Um, we should be uh, engaging more with policymakers, with uh, the field in many different ways in order to make, make, um, to make for an effective change. And this, this comes in different ways. First of all, um, the whole idea of policy evaluation is, is part of politics. So um, in, in the more interpretative understandings of, of policy analysis, it's very clear that you know, it, it demands policymakers to be convinced that a certain policy needs to be evaluated or implemented and evaluated. So in that sense, it's a, it's a dialogue that, ha that should happen uh, besides, let's say, the, the strong causal designs that we might want to develop. Uh, secondly, we should also include, and that, that echoes a bit uh, what Elizabeth has been saying, and also uh, uh, Cecilia, uh, we should also involve professionals in the field. In, in my case, I'm a sociologist of education. In, in education, it's very clear that policies or programs can only be effective if they are shared, if the goals of them are shared by professionals in the field, by teachers, school principals, school boards, and we need to engage with these with these uh, groups of uh, of professionals in order to make an make for an effective policy change. Um, that also involves perhaps that we should be more explicit about the values that are underlying particular policy changes. And of course, those values could be you know um, uh, conflicting. It's not that everybody subscribes to certain values underlying policies, but it is important to explain the values that are underlying policies in order for professionals or school principals, school uh, teachers, to be convinced, hopefully, about the necess necessity of, of, of the reforms that we then would like to study. And um, lastly, maybe a bit on a more micro scale, um, this whole idea that we have a causal design that tells us the causal effect of a certain measure, and we just press a button that you know the policymakers has to uh, have to do, and then they can they can change the world. Um, that, that assumes some sort of a rationalistic understanding of how policy works. But of course, policy never works that way. Um, it is important to be aware and to discuss also with, with policymakers the fact that institutions could develop that are not necessarily rational from a perspective of, of the intended goals. So there's all kinds of non-rationalistic models of, of policy uh, design or institutional design that we should also pay some attention to um, and, and make, make you know, people aware of the fact that institutions, regulations exist in, in for, for example, in schooling systems that are just uh, not necessarily functional for the goals of, of those organizations. So I would I'd like to leave it right there. Thank you. And thank you to all the commentators. And now I invite everyone to come back on screen. We can take down the slide. There we are. And uh, so thank you so much for those wonderful commentaries. Uh, we are joined by uh, the speakers you've heard from so far, and in addition, by Prudence Carter, a professor at Brown University and also a president of the American Sociological Association. So quite a luminous panel we have uh, with us today. And I would like to start out by asking, uh, and, and Prudence was, uh, along with Andrew, one of the co-authors of one of the original papers, and I'd like to start out by asking Brittany, Andrew, and Prudence for any reactions you might care to express now that you've heard the commentaries, starting with Brittany. Great, thank you so much, Adam. So first of all, I just wanna thank the commentary authors for joining us in this important conversation um, and sharing your experience and expertise as inequality researchers. Um, as an early 
career scholar, I learned a great deal from reading these commentaries, um, particularly from Herman and Cecilia about the importance of understanding the social and political context in which we're operating, right? Those areas where we wanna have an impact. Um, but also as someone who is attracted to sociology in particular, um, because I wanted to uh, make a difference in the lives of marginalized folks and communities. I think a lot of um, folks come into these disciplines wanting to make that difference um, and being a little disappointed about like what it actually means to do some of this work. Um, I was really energized by Michelle's commentary on how we can create the infrastructure um, to allow more of a radical kind of transformation in the approach of the work that we do. Um, how we can make it easier for us as scholars to do that work and build connections um, across institutions and partners. Um, and then also Elizabeth's call to really step outside of our rigid um, boundaries as social scientists, um, to put down the master's tools or revision those tools um, in ways that allow us to um, collaborate with the communities that we're interested um, in studying the experiences of. Cecilia also mentioned this. Um, and thinking about ways that we can really bring them into the conversation to understand what it is they need from the work that we're doing. Um, so I'll leave it there um, and allow others to comment. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, um, thank you. I um, was, I came away from reading the set of commentaries um, and I thought to myself, actually the research question we started with was challenged in the first place. We asked what can researchers do and the commentaries are saying, uh, advocating for um, context. Um, that how do we consider context in this work of reducing inequalities? And I wondered, okay, what might institutions do? And that was the fundamental challenge um, from, the, from the commentaries. Um, I want to highlight that since our paper focuses on this issue of scale, um, I wanted to highlight Cecilia's uh, commentary around what happens when, what should we do? Um, in pursuing this research agenda when the social political context is not favorable for pursuing the quote unquote feasibility uh, research and thinking about um, how coordinated activities at lower levels that may not be national, federal level, what's happening at different levels of government, for example, and coordinated activities that test the feasibility um, of this, or of the, the feasibility of solutions to reduce inequality. Um, was something that expanded our thinking around scale. And finally, um, the question around whose ideas and whose knowledge um, in, informs what we scale. And here, um, thinking about um, systems of inequality or systems of oppression is a key um, generative idea to think about where do solution, where are solutions generated? Is it in the ivory tower or in communities? Thank you. Thank you for those remarks, Andrew. Prudence? Well, first I want to just also echo what um, my colleagues have said. These were excellent commentaries and I really appreciate it. The um, engagement and dialogue and taking seriously um, the, the papers that were written. The, the, the one thing that I um, want to say, and I, I think I appreciate as being a social scientist and a sociologist is that um, in the social science community, we can cover everything from the macro to the micro, from the structural to the individual levels. And what I'm actually struck by is the call for um, really systemic and institutional transformation. Both uh, Elizabeth and uh, Michelle's papers did that. Um, and, and also thinking about what we can learn from more organic um, intellectual, social scientists, people in communities, because that is something that in terms of our own methodological and epistemological thinking that social scientists often miss unless you're already of that camp in terms of participatory action research. But I want to actually offer, as I often do, there's a tension here. And as I've been reflecting on these really fine commentaries about what we need to do to build infrastructure within the academy for social scientists to do better in terms of the reduction of inequality or to improve our practice and process, I'm also struck by something that I think we don't quite capture in all of our papers collectively. And that is the mediating role of the social psychological at a collective level as well as the cultural 
I mean, there is this frame shifting, but I'm actually talking about cultural institutions that mediate ideology, how people believe, what they, what is, uh, how, how they are co-opted, or even ideas and behaviors are inculcated in them. And the reason I say that is I think of two opportune moments in American society, missed moments, post-World War II, when the GIs came home from the war, and the GI Bill was there to actually help to build opportunity among these mostly poor and working class men, and racism really mitigated the impact of the American government to actually, um, it, it actually blocked it, not mitigated it. It blocked it, it blinded it, and so to speak, in order to actually build intergenerational wealth through housing, through the through participation in communities. And part of that was because of the collective resistance and um, white supremacist ideas that were built into our de jure, into our institutions. How do you change those institutions? if individuals who run those institutions, those systems themselves have not been transformed. So there is this interplay between the systemic and also the individual level. Similarly, the anemic uh, implementation of Brown versus Board of Education, another missed opportune moment in American society to more equalize educational opportunities, resistance resistance at the collective level that then shape kinds of policies and practices. So we have this really tense interplay between what could be done at a structural, a legal political level and what's happening in at the individual and even community levels because you have the juxtaposition of multiple forms of inequalities economic inequality racial inequality and then there i say if we can get into gender inequality so I, I think we have a lot of work to do i think this has been quite generative I, and again i really appreciate the the commentaries and and welcome more questions and ways for where we can move forward as a, a community of social scientists. Thanks, Prudence. And wow, what a vivid illustration of the problem of trying to rebuild the master's house using the master's tools. Uh, any of the commentary writers like to jump in on any of these points? Elizabeth, you looked like you were about to uh, jump in, so I'm going to call on you. Oh, of course you are, Adam. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I was nodding and, you know, amening and everything to Prudence because um, actually just grappling with uh, an instance of that right now. And I think you really hit the nail on the head, Prudence, with the idea of, you know, we can't, we don't, we can't give up attention to in changing individuals and changing the, I would say the discourse practices of individuals because discourse drives so much of our thinking and our cultural practices and values. And, um, you know, thinking about that tension and how we navigate that tension, how we actually build um, conversations across the systemic and the individual. And, you know, Adam, you had posed um, a question to, to me and to uh, Andrew about, you know, how does this represent, um, the, this conversation represent our work. Um, I work in the field of education uh, and, and everything about education institutions um, is, is reproduced through individual practices every single day, every single moment. And so there is this important um, need to attend to both the systems and to these individual practices. So I say here, here to Prudence and, and to, to Andrew uh, and Brittany as well as in their comments. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, I did want to turn to you and Andrew in particular because, you know, Socius is the sociology journal. Um, we're talking to largely an audience of sociologists, but both of you come from disciplines outside of sociology. And so I was interested in whether this is just an inside sociology conference conversation or whether you think it has broader uh, resonance uh, for the social sciences more generally. Uh, Andrew, do you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, actually, interestingly, I, I come from an applied psychology uh, field um, and we think both about uh, what's, how, how might we leverage insights from psychology and human development to support human beings to thrive, um, especially on young people in across contexts. And um, how do we design the kinds of interventions that support that? And interestingly, I actually think that the um, frame shifting um, research can be very relevant 
for expanding the kinds of frames that we draw on, at least in, um, in, in applied psychology and um, related fields, where we, a lot of the questions that we ask and a lot of the interventions that we design are focused on changing individuals. And so including frames that bring in some of the macro and meso level um, context of future that are preventing thriving the, um, and especially these frameworks of inequality is important, especially as we think about the kinds of how we design theories of change that connect um, how we are supporting individuals to thrive in systems of, of oppression. How do we reimagine um, merely doing a mindfulness intervention, for example, with um, how, how does an intervention that we are designing for an individual or at the individual level connect to or disrupt some of the processes um, that are at the meso slash macro level. There are other, there's two other ways that I think that this conversation matters. One is around how we choose to leverage our tools of evaluation in this field. Typically, um, evaluation is um, removed from or considered uh, separate from um, the community or the program designers, and we tend to align the tools of evaluation with the values of those who are already in power. And so there's a question around how do we align the tools of evaluation with the questions, issues, and innovations that are already coming from the community how do we validate those, um, those innovations? How do we contribute to improving and amplifying them when and if they work? And so that is one way. The other, um, the other issue that comes up is really around um, researchers who come in, um, are, especially I, I'm an earlier career uh, researcher, um, who come in with questions that are being, that are close to uh, the communities where in our training, we are told our questions are too close to the problem. Our questions are too close to the ground. And so there is a, there is a tension around bridging what research has happened before with contemporary understandings of um, issues that are affecting communities. Um, and that, that makes me wonder about integrating both the macro and the meso in the psychology that we do. Thanks, Andrew. And you've touched on an issue that is related to one of the questions that's come in from the audience. The question is directed to Cecilia Menjivar, so I'll pose it to you first, Cecilia, but invite others to jump in if they wish. And this is about involving communities in the research that you do. Uh, after all, uh, you're uh, studying communities that have faced fear and surveillance. You need to understand their experiences, but also respect the constraints they face in building political capital and organizing. So how do you na navigate that with the communities that are so deeply impacted by the constraints of inequality? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, it is very central to, to me and to my own, my own work and that of others. Um, the, this, is, um, this is something that we discuss quite a bit, how to how to involve communities that are so deeply um, affected, made vulnerable, made fearful, and um, in a context that, that does not seem to change. Again, the social political context that is so, um, so anti everything that, um, that, that relates to immigration these days. Um, one way to do that, I think, is to remind ourselves of our responsibility to these communities. And so doing research by involving um, immigrant communities, for instance, also means that we have to make our research available to those who advocate on the ground for them. And, and this is something that it, sometimes is missing when we um, make calls for involving communities and in our research that we don't remember that we can find very easy ways to make our research available to them as they to provide them tools to for themselves to advocate for their for their um, for their in their efforts. Um, so on the one hand. Um, Involving immigrant uh, communities in our research is key. I could not do work without um, first 
knowing what is important for them. But at the same time, we have this other responsibility to, um, and this is where we can make an impact um, by not only by speaking directly to policymakers who sometimes may not even listen to us, um, but to, in, to provide this information to the communities we involve in our research so they can also have um, the tools to advocate for themselves. Well, that is a fantastic segue to another question that's come in from the audience, which is in communicating, in quote, communicating basic facts of inequality to the public, unquote, I think that was a quote from Brittany's presentation. Is there any evidence about what what current works well, about what works well? Op-eds, expert testimony for court cases, establishing relationship with journalists, et cetera. And here, Cecilia, you've given us one answer, establishing relationships with advocacy groups, providing them tools to advocate effectively. And I think at the William T. Grant Foundation, we've learned a lot about this and writing op-eds and providing testimony uh, are very limited means <laughs> of influencing policy and practice. It turns out, um, you know, we, we social scientists have the idea that our job is to figure stuff out and write it up and then throw it over the wall and there's somebody waiting on the other side of the wall to catch it and run along and make some policy with it. It doesn't work that way. And I think, Herman, you were alluding to this when you said that po policy making is not this linear rational process of, oh, let's check the research. Oh, let's do that. Instead, uh, getting evidence used in policy is about building relationships with the policymakers or practitioners themselves or with intermediary organizations such as the kind of adv advocacy groups, uh, Cecilia, that you were discussing, that it's about establishing trust. It's about uh, providing information that can go into the everyday organizational routines of decision makers. Um, and you know, we as social scientists, we have to recognize that research evidence that we provide is not going to drive policy de decisions. There are other things that come into consider consideration, including values, priorities, resource constraints. Our goal should be to have evidence at the table when these decisions are made. A great example that responds to this question is the National Academy's panel on a roadmap to reducing child poverty, which uh, responded to a request from the US Congress to identify concrete strategies to cut child poverty in half in 10 years. A number of these strategies were in fact incorporated into the American rescue plan. Uh, sadly, they had one year duration and they've not been extended, such as the child uh, tax credit expansion. But um, this was a case where there was an engagement with members of Congress, first of all, who put forward the request. And second of all, exactly as you were describing, Cecilia, a relationship with an advocacy organization that was able to mobilize uh, action uh, using the National Academy's report as fuel, but drawing attention to this evidence through its advocacy work. And so I think we social scientists have to get away from the idea that our job is to tell people stuff. Rather, our job is to build relationships. At the William T. Grant Foundation, we like to say, let's move away from dissemination and embrace engagement. Well, speaking of the role for social scientists, I had another question that I want to ask, and this one is for Cecilia and for Prudence Carter. Both of you have held the top leadership position at the American Sociological Association. So what is the role, <coughs> if any, for a professional association like ASA in helping to move this shift from understanding to reducing inequality and from redoing systems so that inequality will not be generated. What's the role for the ASA? Maybe Prudence will start with you and then go to Cecilia. Well, I wanted to defer to Madam President, Cecilia. <laughs> President-elect, she's the current president. Uh, so I don't mind deferring to you first. This is your year. Prudence, go ahead, please. Well, I, I, I appreciate because I believe if I, um, Michelle, 
And I would love to hear Michelle say um, a few things about this. And when she talked about specifically her writing about um, what it is that we need to do within the professional field itself, the discipline, the infrastructure that's built. And ASA can play a role. Surely, if our discipline encapsulate everything that has to do with society, right? And so the reduction of inequality is something that matters. Um, but th there are some tensions, and I've written about this um, some, but I think when we think about first, there's the big question of what drives or causes, and I think Herman has also talked about causal analysis. We have a lot, as Michelle has written, we know a lot about it. What we don't do, particularly in elite professional sociology departments, is valorize, or R1 departments, some do, some don't, is valorize the practice-oriented, the community-engaged research, the policy research. We valorize the theoretical and conceptual knowledge that we generate as sociologists. And that is a fissure that I think, and I know Brittany and Tom also wrote about this in their paper, that's there. When you think of our colleagues in other social sciences like psychology and economics, they transcend domains. They're not just in economics departments or psychology departments. They're in the field. They're in policy schools. Sociology is not a field that has opened itself up to the same extent um, for the community engaged, uh, policy engaged research. Some do. I'm not saying we can name a, a number who do that. But I think a number of assist junior scholars feel the tension. Like, am I going to get tenure? if I do this kind of research. So I think what ASA, uh, and certainly in my own year, this is something that I want to drive, is thinking about the educative power of sociology, not just theoretically, but in practice and policy as well. And so how we build research practice partnerships, which I know the William T. Grant Foundation supports quite a bit, um, through universities and agencies and school districts and um, child youth agencies, all of those, I'll shut up now. Those are the relationships that, um, and conduits of knowledge building about the reduction of inequality that should matter increasingly more, I believe. And ASA could help facilitate, and I know that we are having those discussions, starting to have those more broadly, more, more deeply, rather. Cecilia. Thank you, thank you. Um, what can the ASA do? Um, I think that um, I agree with, um, with Prudence on what we do as a discipline in sociology, what we do in, in departments, what we, um, what we, we, get, we give way to and how, how that is understood um, by our colleagues is, is very important. On the ASA side, um, I, the ASA is a, already has um, a, some structures in place to um, engage in policy. Um, there, are, um, the, there is a department dedicated to, to broader engagement, but definitely more can be done along the lines that Prudence mentioned, including, I think this is so crucial, including changing public views. Um, that is a crucial educational component um, that is, is, is very difficult because we're not talking about policymakers. We're not talking about people who are already located in institutions. We're talking about public attitudes, because very often, as sociological research has shown, even if we change policies, even if we change laws, attitudes, public attitudes, everyday attitudes remain entrenched. And how do we get there? How do we get people to understand um, the different issues across policy domains that we are trying to make an impact in? How do we um, get people to change their views that immigrants are not criminals, for instance? How do we um, shift the framing for the general public? That is a component that is more difficult, but could have longer term effects. 
and facilitate the social political the reception of our re, of our scholarship in the broader social political context because we're educating voters as well so that's something that we can do more of and we should um and hopefully there's a way to do that in within the the organization thanks, thanks to both of you uh, let me bring in now uh, michelle jackson and uh, herman van der verforst you know uh much of this conversation has been very u.s focused and uh the two of you do a lot of international engagement through the isa's research committee on social stratification rc28 and through uh all of your work uh how does this strike you is this a distinctively american conversation or does this have broader international resonance? Well, let's start with you, Michelle. So I'm gonna give that classic academics answer of yes and no. Um, so in some ways, I mean, Europe, which I know best, so Europe has many of the same discussions that the US has had. Many of the same patterns in policy are evident in Europe just as they are in the US. So Take, for example, the growth of nudges. I mean, that's something that took off in Europe in just the same way as it took off in the US. Governments were very attracted by the, these ideas of nudge units and getting things done at low cost. So many of those trends are common across these different countries. Um, you also have in common, of course, the, the problem that inequality is getting bigger and it's a kind of fundamental problem and the policy is not doing the job of, of dealing with that to the extent that we might want it to happen. I do think that where something like the EU, for example, is different is that it is much better at seeing commonalities in problems across different institutional spheres. So uh, you have more effort to build expansive policy that could touch several different types of inequality at once. I mean, that is something that certainly the EU has the structures for and I think it does rather well on. Uh, it's also, of course, taken for granted in many European countries and including the UK, um, that the state has certain roles and responsibilities, which maybe in the US people don't have those same expectations. Now, I think one thing is really important to say, though, is that like the US is not necessarily even the US. I mean, many of the radical policies that I would think of are actually from you know, American history. So think about you know, UBI, basic income. Much of the evidence for basic income comes from the negative tax negative income tax experiments from the 1960s and 70s. In our evidence on early childhood education, again, comes from the US. So the US used to be much more radical and much more prepared to make these big changes than it is today. So I guess I would prefer to see it not as a US versus Europe situation, but a, you know, a US versus Europe and early US. You know, This country used to do something very different with respect to policy and, and Certainly think it's important to remember that. Thanks, Herman. Yeah, maybe um, to um, <clears throat> shed a bit light on, on how things are on this side of the uh, Atlantic. Um, in the Netherlands, um, we have a lot of the same debates as, as, as that you're having, but I think um, we, we, we have moved a bit further along in, in terms of these collaborations between policymakers, uh, the fields and uh, scientists. So. One example is the way we fund education research. That's really funded by an organization that is headed under the National Science Foundation, um, but is, is, is uh, run by uh, the tripartite um, uh, system of scientists, uh, policymakers, and the field, education field in this case. Um, so any, anything that is funded goes through boards, that, or even the calls are, 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 are determined in, in, in boards in which all, those three parties are all situated. So, so that in itself illustrates, I think, that the, there's a strong relevance of the infrastructure, the data infrastructure that Andrew mentioned in, 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 in Prudence uh, in, in your paper, but also Michelle mentioned in her, in her discussion paper. Um, so the data infrastructure is very important. And I think in that regard, uh, many of the European countries are now really moving ahead in terms of uh, uh, you know, registered data availability. And this infrastructure is so important, I think, in the sense that as soon as you know, the Netherlands is a country of pretty low economic inequality, right? So our Gini coefficient is comparatively low um, in, in household incomes uh, after taxation and, and, 
etc. So, uh, so there's a there's a quite an equal uh, situation. But as soon as there's one hinge of a direction of an increase of inequality, the newspapers are full of it because it is known. There's a data infrastructure that tells us that you know as soon as this policy is implemented, the pensioners will go down in their income, or the uh, families with young children will suffer uh, without uh, you know let's say with median incomes. So, so for detailed groups of, of people, it is known what the consequences are of policies. And that, that requests a data infrastructure. So I think it's very important. And in education, we see it now too. We have a data infrastructure of school children of the whole country. We have all of, all of the children in, in, the, in the databases. And it's not only interesting for us as researchers to set the alarm and, you know, look at this inequality is going up. No, the results of those data are feeding into the schools directly. They, go, they get reports every year, every school about their children and where their children go to when they leave their school, uh, how they're doing compared to other schools uh, of similar uh, composition. So, so, and that requests the data infrastructure. And I think that's really important to, uh, to, to, uh, to mention once again, I think. Herman, let me stick with you for a question that's come in from the audience. And we have about three minutes left. So uh, let's try to, try to be quick so we can get one more question after this. Uh, this is coming from someone who describes himself as a public activist sociologist. He wants to know, at what point in the research design development process should researchers think about policy engagement? Before results, after results, in the formulation of the hypothesis? When is the most time to think about this policy engagement? Herman? Thank you. I think this is a very good question. And it's also um, an important question because as soon as, uh, let's say, um, policymakers want to involve society more in research, the standard uh, contribution is to ask the field or ask um, the world uh, for what are the interesting research questions. And I think that that misclassifies or misjudges the quality of scientists, which is to ask questions. But for us to, to make questions that are relevant for the fields, we need to engage with the field in setting up those questions. And, and that's that's how a partnership should, should go about. Because if we can develop questions that are interesting for, let's say, a school, um, but are also interesting for us as academic researchers. It means that we are able to formulate those questions in the context of broader, let's say, scientific ambitions or scientific questions. And that layeredness of questions is crucial, I would say, for partnerships to be successful because it becomes relevant for us as academics, interesting, important, um, but also relevant for the schools. So I Thanks. think it's really in the setting up the question already. Thanks, Herman. And the last question is going to be for Brittany Fox Williams. Brittany, you started us off, and I'm going to let you take us home. Um, you know, you're at a relatively early phase of your career as an assistant professor. How you must have thought a lot about these issues, having written about them so deeply and worked on this for a number of years. What is the right stance for an early career researcher in thinking about these radical ideas of uh, how to pursue sociology? Right. Well, I think Prudence brought up one of the questions that's always in the back of our mind is that, I'm, am I going to get tenure? Right. But I think there are conversations that are being had among early career scholars, particularly on Twitter, um, about doing the work that fulfills you and that matters to the communities that you love. Um, and whether you get tenure, great, right? But if you don't, there are other ways that you can contribute. Um, there are folks who think they do all the right things and produce all the right papers and don't get tenure, right? And so I think it's really important for us to do the work that fulfills us and the communities that we care about um, from the start. Uh, and, and that's pretty much kind of my, my thoughts on that. And I'm sure there are others who feel the same way. All right, well, Brittany Fox-Williams, Andrew Nalani, Herman van der Verfors, Cecilia Menchivar, Prudence Carter, Michelle Jackson, and Elizabeth Moji, thank you for your contributions, for your work. Thank you for your contributions to Socius, and thank you for participating in today's webinar.